The passage I want to draw your attention to today is the one that was just read to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Just two verses will be our focus. In this series, I, honestly, uh, I, we have quite a few people who are visiting today. So let me take a couple of minutes just to make sure we're all on the same page with what we have been doing um, these weeks throughout October as we gather for worship. We're taking a look at the doctrines of the Word of God, the Scriptures, the written Word. And what, I mean, what we mean by that is not the doctrines that the Bible teaches, but the doctrines concerning what the Bible is. And so it is authoritative because it is directly given from God through men, prophets and apostles, and written down so that it is the Word of God, not a word about God. So it is authoritative. That's the first very clear thing you need to understand about the Scriptures. And that's what we looked at a few weeks ago, even. The second thing we have to understand about the Bible is that it is inerrant, which is a, another way to say it is without error. It is perfect. So not only is it authoritative coming from God, but since it is God's Word given to us, God has preserved it in such a way that it is without error, perfect, flawless. It's not only authoritative or without error, it's also clear. Because God himself is not unclear when he speaks to us, he speaks in ways that are clear. So that we don't have to try to crack some kind of code to figure out what God is saying in his word. We have to study it. We have to be diligent to make sure we understand what God is saying in the context and all that. But it's not unclear. God's word is clear. Fourth, not only authoritative, not only without error, not only is it clear, but it's also necessary. Meaning what God has written, given to us in his written word is necessary if we're going to know divine truth. If you're going to know authoritative truth, who you are, who God is, how he saves us through Jesus, you're not getting that through extra biblical revelation. You're getting that. The only grounds that you're going to get that is from God's word. It's necessary if we're going to be saved. If we're going to know God's will, it's necessary. And now, fifthly, in the final week that we're dealing with these doctrines of the Scriptures, it's not only all those other things, it's also sufficient. It's sufficient. Meaning, basically, the, the necessity of the Scriptures means if we want to know what's true, we've got to go to the Bible. Okay? And the sufficiency means we don't go beyond the Bible, if you want to know what's authoritatively true and what the will of God is. The necessity, we got to go to it. The sufficiency, you don't go beyond it. You don't go to anything else. The scriptures are sufficient. So typically when we gather for worship, we just pick a book of the Bible and work through the entire book. But from time to time, we pull back from just working through a book. We spent 37 weeks going through the book of Romans just before this. At times, we pull back and look at things more topically, and what does God's Word have to say concerning this? And so, we're in our fifth week of that today. And it is October, which we typically just celebrate as Church History Month, which we look back throughout church history to have a good understanding of how God has worked and what God has done throughout history, so we can know our Christian family history, and by knowing church history, that will save you from dying of a thousand heresies. When you understand false teachings that have come up all throughout church history and how the church has risen up and responded with what God says in his word to those, you'll be saved from a ton of errors that spring up all the time. And you go, oh, this person's saying this? Well, Montanus said that in the second century and the church clearly rose up and said, no, 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 no. The Bible says this, you're wrong. Pelagius rose up and said certain things that 
people today are saying. But if you know church history, you just go, nope, that's Pelagianism. That's already been clearly written about by the church showing, no, God's word says wrong. And so we're safeguarded by knowing church history. And in this series, we're looking at church history concerning what the church has believed about God's word. And so today, when we look at the sufficiency of scripture, as you find your place in 2 Timothy 3, which you probably already have, by way of introduction, I want to draw your attention to a guy named John Owen. John Owen was born the same year of William Shakespeare's death, 1616. When he was just 33 years old, that's actually the same age I am right now, he preached before the English Parliament. 33. It wasn't even his first time to do it, but it was a significant time because it was less than 24 hours after King Charles I was publicly executed. And when Parliament says, we are dealing with this tumultuous time, we need a gospel preaching minister to address us in this crisis. They called on John Owen, even though he was only 33 years old. A year later, at age 34, he was appointed the vice chancellor of the University of Oxford by the English general and future Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. Now, if you know your history at all, you go, whoa, I know who Oliver Cromwell is. Pretty big deal. Lord Protector for a while. He appointed Owen as the Vice Chancellor, which is the way that in America we would say the President of the University. Vice Chancellor sounds a lot better. The English have some things right. John Owen is regarded as England's greatest theologian to ever live. If you've never read anything by Owen, it'll take about five minutes to go, I'm, he's out of my league. <laughs> I'm dealing with a superior intellect and a superior knowledge of the scripture. He's often called the Calvin of England, as John Calvin in the 1500s was regarded and is still regarded to this day probably the greatest theologian outside of the biblical authors to ever live. Even someone who opposed Calvin's teaching, Jacob Arminius, whom Arminianism, which gets pitted against Calvinism, Jacob Arminius even said, there is no one that exceeds John Calvin in his ability to comment on Scripture. No one exceeds Calvin. So even his enemies regarded him as, Calvin's like, that's as good as it gets as far as a theologian. And then... A century later, John Owen is regarded as such a towering intellect when it comes to the matters of the Bible. People just started calling him England's Calvin. He's the English version of John Calvin. He's most remembered for two significant works. One of them is called The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. Just memorize that and you have a good idea of what Jesus was doing on the cross. The death of death in the death of Christ. That's a long work. There still to this day, that is the best work that has ever been written on what God did through Jesus Christ on the cross to redeem his people. He brings up specific points in that book that still those to this day, though they would disagree with his Calvinistic type leanings, they cannot answer the arguments Owen makes from the scriptures concerning what Jesus was doing on the cross. The death of death and the death of Christ still stands all these years later, the greatest work ever written on the cross. His other most remembered work is a smaller book, which was a sermon series they turned into a book, and it's called On the Mortification of Sin in Believers, which means how to kill sin and follow Jesus as a Christian. And in that little book is his John Owen's most famous line that I know some of you personally have t-shirts with this written on. Many of you have probably shared this quote or read it. But in The Mortification of Sin, that book, Owen says, Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. He's just quoting on Romans chapter 8 when Paul says, 
If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. So Owen just says, what Paul is saying is you better be killing sin or sin is killing you. He often allowed himself only four hours of sleep per night so that he could more, have more time to study. A lot of guys did that. Calvin did stuff like that. And later in their life, most all of them go, I really wrecked my body when I was younger. I thought I could get by on four hours of sleep and not eating very much because it made me feel sluggish. So I just won't eat. I only drink water, barely sleep. I need to study more. Most of them later in their life, like Owen, he regretted the punishment he had given to his physical resources. He and his wife Mary had 11 children, and one of them lived to adulthood. This is the time they lived in. Most children died. His daughter even ended up dying before he did, the one that made it to adulthood. You see, the reformers, the century before Owen lived, they had defended the sufficiency of God's word in the scriptures. The early church believed God's word is sufficient. We don't need to go beyond. If you want to know what God's will is, you want to know how to be saved, you want to know how to please God in your life, you want to know how to have hope, how to dispel your fears, the scripture is sufficient to reveal that. The early church believed that clearly. And then around 500, for about a millennium, there was a slow decline as Roman Catholicism came into prominence and the church started adding to the sufficiency of the scriptures and said, no, 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 we need the scriptures and we need the traditions of men, which the church preserves, they say. We need the scriptures and we need the word of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. We need the scriptures and we need the creeds and the councils. And then the reformers burst onto the scene, mostly beginning with Martin Luther, saying, no, the scripture alone is sufficient. You don't need to go further than that. The scripture is sufficient. So the year before he, he died, Martin Luther said, let the man who would hear God speak read holy scripture. And so many have said from that time on, you want to hear what God's you want to hear God speak to you? Read the Bible out loud. God speaks to us in the scriptures. And then came up along the Libertines and the Anabaptists. And basically, we're not going to go deep into that, but they denied the sufficiency of the scripture. So then after Luther, the Libertines, Anabaptists rise up denying the sufficiency of scripture. And John Calvin writes clearly showing no, 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 no. The scripture says it's sufficient in and of itself. So Calvin even says, The prophets and apostles, which are the ones who wrote the Bible, the prophets and apostles boast not of their own genius or of any of those talents which conciliate the faith of the hearers, nor do they insist on arguments from reason, but they bring forward the sacred name of God to compel the submission of the whole world to the Bible. God alone is a sufficient witness of himself in his own word. God, if we want to hear the truth about someone, we want to typically hear it from their own mouth, right? You hear hearsay, you hear gossip, and what you should say to someone else is, have you talked to that person about this? Someone sins against you, Jesus says, go and talk to your brother. You hear gossip, go and talk to the source. And so Calvin's just saying, uh, you want to know what God says, go to where God speaks, which is in the Bible. God himself is a sufficient witness of himself in his own word. And then came along the Puritans in the 1600s, and they wanted to see the Church of England be pure, holy, devoted to Jesus as he's revealed in his word. And so in 1647, in chapter 1, section 6 of what's called the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Puritans had come together for years, over 1,100 meetings, 
all these pastors and some laymen came together to write out these confessions of what the Scripture teaches. And the very first chapter of their confession of faith has to do with the written Word of God. And in it, they write this. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or traditions of men. You don't need to look for new extra-biblical revelations. God said something to this person. You just go, nope. God, I, I think God said something to me in my prayer this morning. Nope. What is written? What you think God said to you when you were praying today or yesterday is absolutely no, no authority. What is written is our authority. We go to the scriptures because they are sufficient. Don't trust yourself too much. Then after the Puritans, who write so clearly concerning the sufficiency of scripture, the Quakers came along. And the Quakers were honestly a lot like charismatics have been in the 20th century. Isn't that weird to think about? The Quakers, you think about the Quakers right now and you go, they're not like Pentecostals. Well, the reason they were called Quakers is because in their church meetings, they would sit around in a circle and they would just say, we don't need to open the Bible, really. We need to sit around and pray and meditate and contemplate until one of us feels like God is saying something to them, and then that person will stand up and say, the Lord has just said to me this. And they claimed that they had manifestations of the Holy Spirit with them shaking and convulsing and quaking. But they denied the sufficiency of scriptures, and they actually emphasized a lack of study that, yeah, studying the Bible is okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good, but... You really want to get in tune with the secrets of God. You need to spend time in prayer, and then God will just deposit new revelations to you. Totally undermining what God actually says in His Word concerning what He's communicated to us. So, then enter John Owen into that discussion. And Owen writes a book called A Defense of the Sacred Scriptures Against the Fanatics in 1659. A defense of the sacred scriptures against the fanatics. I'm going to read you some quotes from this, and I want you to be shocked by what John Owen says concerning those who claim to be getting extra biblical revelations from God. And the reason I want it to shock you, well, I, I want you to see what the church has always believed. And this is what the church would always say, because this is what the scriptures lead us to say concerning those who would claim to get revelations from God, these brand new progressive revelations. This is what the church would always say. But what Owen says seems shocking to us because many and most in the 20th century and now the 21st century have caved to the charismatic teaching that God progressively speaks to you in your prayers and just gives you a word and I'm going to say it to you. Most have just caved to that even though they have no warrant in the Bible to believe that. So therefore what John Owen says against that seems like, whoa! It's like this, what he says is just the normal conclusions drawn from the Scripture. First he says, the Scriptures are the settled ordinary, perfect, and unshakable rule for divine worship, and they leave no room for any new revelations. What is the practical, he says again, what is the practical use for Scripture if it is so incomplete as to need poor mortal men to be continually adding, it, adding to it? Where is its perfection? It says it's perfect, how is it perfect if we need 
new revelations constantly. He says, God has revealed in the Bible everything that is needed for our salvation and to enable us to worship Him. Again, it is most supreme arrogance and pride for mere men to propose novel new matters of faith or practice not revealed by God himself in his word. Supreme arrogance and pride for anyone to propose, God said this to me, we need to do this. As the teachings of the fanatics contain matters alien to the scriptures, shun them as diabolical, useless, groundless, and false. The Bible is a complete and perfect rule. Since the completion of the canon of Scripture, which is our 66 books written by the prophets and the apostles, since the completion of the canon of Scripture, there are no new revelations. None are to be expected or admitted. If the Scriptures are perfect and complete, then what need for new revelations? Uncontrolled enthusiasm. All of these ways are uncertain, dangerous, useless, and totally unnecessary. They must be rejected and shunned. That's the orthodox position of the church in all ages. Owen believed that, taught that, defended that. And in 1662, along with about 2,000 other ministers, John Owen was ejected from the local church that he served as a pastor in. Because those 2,000 ministers would not conform to what the king said they must do when they gather as the church for worship. The Book of Common Prayer was written and distributed to all the ministers and all the churches in England, and the king said, you do in worship exactly what this book says. And Owen and about 2,000 other ministers said, we will not. We can't. Because it's said to do things that are not in the Bible. Owen stood for the sufficiency of Scripture so much so that he was rejected and ejected from his church. They passed laws that said you could not live within five miles of the church building that you once ministered at if you did not submit to the Book of Common Prayer. They outlawed preaching unless you were authorized by the state and by the Church of England. Thereafter, under the threat of arrest, Owen served as the pastor of a nonconformist congregation, and he spent about the next 20 years of his life writing, 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 writing. He couldn't be at the university anymore. He wasn't vice chancellor any longer, the president. He was exiled, essentially, and he pastored a small church outside of the reach of those laws, even under the threat of arrest. He died in 1683, leaving behind him a legacy of writings that now occupy 24 large volumes. Each volume of those 24 that Owen wrote is about 600 pages. John Owen wrote more than you will probably read in your life. And he did it mostly defending and teaching what God says in his word because what God says in his word is sufficient. Let that be our introduction to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Open, open your Bibles with me and let's see in the scripture what would lead somebody like Owen to be so serious about the sufficiency of what God says in his word that he'd be willing to be exiled and kicked out of his church, branded someone unfaithful. This is the Apostle Paul writing his last letter to his young protege, Timothy, who is the pastor, one of the pastors, at the church of Ephesus. This is the last letter the Apostle Paul writes before he dies. He dies. 
He tells Timothy, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I know my time is soon. He has final words to say to this young pastor as he essentially passes the torch to Timothy as he's pastoring in Ephesus, a church Paul planted, among many others. And one of the final things he says to him concerns God's word and its sufficiency. Look at verse 16. These two verses, the reason we're going through two is because basically every word in these two verses has to be, it's like a bomb. What does that mean? Oh my gosh, what does that mean? We've got to look at every single word. This is so jam-packed with how we should understand what God's word is. So let's take it and take it slowly. In verse 16, Paul writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. What does he mean by scripture? It means what we just call the Bible. What God has communicated to us through his prophets in the Old Testament and his apostles in the New Testament. What is written? All scripture, all 66 books that we have that compose our Bible. He says, all scripture. What does that word all mean in the Greek? It means all. All scripture, all of the Bible, all of the written word of God, he, th- he says is breathed out by God. It's just one word. Paul's writing in Greek. We have to translate it into English. We can't even do it with one word, what he's actually saying. It's the Greek word theonoustos. Theo meaning God, noustos meaning breath that proceeds from someone. So that's why it's translated in some, God breathed. What he's saying is all of the scripture, when he says the breath coming out of someone, that's them communicating someone else. When I speak, Breath is coming out. If I don't breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, I can't keep speaking. And what he's saying is all scripture comes from the mouth of God himself. All scripture is God breathed. It doesn't mean that the men were writing scripture and God blew on them, something like that. No, he's saying all scripture comes from the mouth of God through his prophets and apostles, and written down for us. Second Peter chapter 1, the apostle Peter says the same exact thing using different language. Peter says, I was on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. I saw Jesus in his glory transfigured before me, and God the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then a few verses later, Peter uses the same exact word and said, just as the voice from heaven when we saw Jesus, we heard the audible voice of God. It was born, carried from heaven to us, and we heard God's word audibly. He says, so it is with the scriptures. Men wrote as they were born along by the Holy Spirit, carried as God carries his word from heaven to the earth to us. So when we read the scripture, it should have the same bearing on us, the same tenacity as it would if you sitting here heard the audible voice of God booming from heaven. Because all scripture is God breathed. And then Paul goes on to explain, what do we do with that? What does that mean then for us? If the Bible comes from the mouth of God, what does that mean for us? He says, well, therefore, it's profitable. If that's not an understatement, (laughs) it's profitable. You want profit? You want to be helped? Go to the scripture because it's breathed out by God. It's God speaking to you. It's profitable, it's helpful, serviceable, advantageous, it's beneficial, it's fruitful. All scripture 
is profitable. And then he says what it is profitable for. And the first thing he says, notice, he says it is profitable for teaching. Now that word, if it's a verb, it means what I'm doing right now, teaching you. So is Paul saying the scriptures, if you're going to teach people, the scriptures are profitable in order to teach people. The verb teaching. It's not a verb. It's a noun. What he's meaning is teaching being a body of teaching. A better word would probably be doctrine. What we understand. So it's profitable to know what we should know. It's not a verb. It's not profitable for me to teach you. It's profitable for us to have the teachings of God. To know what God says concerning an issue. It's not just beneficial to help people teach. It's beneficial, it's profitable to know what God says. So you, if you say, we don't really need doctrine, or we don't need to be so focused on doctrine, Paul says, Pfft. yes, you do. Because you do believe doctrine. You do believe certain things about God, about yourself, about the world, about how you should live, about how you should structure your time, about the nature of Jesus, how we're saved, will we persevere to the end. You believe things about all of those issues. And so do I. As R.C. Sproul said, one of the last books he put out before he died, it was called, Everyone is a Theologian. And he's right. You don't have a choice. You are a theologian. You have thoughts and beliefs about God. Are they based on the teachings of the Scripture? That's the real question. Because the Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for that, for doctrine, for teaching. It's also profitable, he says. Notice all these things. He puts the word for in between, every one of them. It's breathed out by God and profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for understanding the truth. It's also profitable for reproof. Reproof would be someone is going the wrong direction in, in some way, whether by what they do or what they believe, and a reproof would be like a rebuke. It would be something that could correct you and turn you around. You need to repent of sin. You want other people who don't yet know Jesus to see the sufficiency of Jesus, to become a Christian, come to faith in him, be forgiven of their sins, be counted righteous before God. You want people to be saved? They need to be reproved. They need to be rebuked. They need to be turned around. And the scripture is sufficient for reproof, to correct us. The next word that Paul uses, he says, it's not only profitable for teaching or for reproof, it's also profitable for correction, which has a little bit more to do with making sure you are on the right path, going the right way. Reproof has to do with you're going this way and you need to be blasted, so you go, I need to change. And correction makes sure that you're walking the correct way. You want to live according to the truth? You want to live a life that's not wasted? If your life is not based on what God has revealed in his word, you're wasting every breath. And so am I. Why do I do the things I do? Why do I believe the things that I believe? Why do I do anything? If, it's not, if we're not seriously seeking to have everything guided by God's word, we're wasting our lives. The scripture is profitable for teaching, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This word training, it's used six other times in the New Testament, and it's never, outside of this, translated training. It's always translated discipline or disciplining. Training, discipline, those can be synonyms. Right? Like you're training for an event. That's what the word is meaning. For training us, helping us become disciplined in righteousness and how we should think and how we should live. Living and thinking as you ought, as God has created you to and saved you to, 
and empowered you to. The scriptures are sufficient for training in righteousness so that we may be disciplined people, with our eyes focused on Jesus, thankful for him, and doing everything we can to follow him, to live as we ought to live. Why do we need the scriptures then? Or what do they produce? What does God do? As we look to the teaching, the reproof, the correction, the training in righteousness, he says in verse 17, so that, or that the man or the messenger of God may be complete. Now he's, he says the messenger of God, the man of God, because he's writing to Timothy, who's a pastor. It's not intended only for Timothy. It's intended for us as well. But that's why he says, so that the messenger of God may be complete. But it's not only pastors, elders, overseers of the church or leaders of the church that the scripture guides in a complete way or equips in a complete way. It's all of us. It's all of us. That the man of God may be complete. This means perfect, lacking nothing, totally fit and apt. If that's not a word that zeroes in how sufficient the script, zeroes in on how sufficient the scripture is, then what else do you need? What we should believe, doctrine, reproof, we need to be reproved constantly. Correction, we need to be corrected constantly. Training in righteousness, disciplining in righteousness, we need that. And what does it do? Well, it does, God does all of those things through his word so that we may be complete. In case we don't get it, he uses another word that means close to the same thing. Fit, complete, perfect, apt. And then he uses another word that means finished and ready. Thoroughly furnished. That's what the word equipped means. He uses these double words to make sure that we don't miss what he's saying. That the scriptures are sufficient for you and for me. That we may be equipped, ready, established, furnished for every good work. That word every is the same word all in the beginning of verse 16. It means it means every. All the good works that God has laid out before you that you should walk in them, the scriptures are sufficient to equip you, to complete you, so that you may walk in the good works that God has saved you to walk in. This is why God has saved us. This phrase, good works, I mean, it's the same thing in Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, through faith in Jesus and what he's done. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right? We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. It's free because Jesus bought it for us. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then he says, and we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not saved by our good works. Religion says, do these works for God and God will love you. The gospel of Jesus says, you could never do anything to put God in your debt. You could never live in such a way that would make God go, wow. In fact, the exact opposite. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel says you could never, so Jesus did. He lived without sin so that you may be counted righteous. He stood in your place on the cross paying your penalty for sin so that we're saved by grace. It's a gift. It's free. 
through faith, through confidence and trust in Jesus, not a result of works. And then in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, Paul says, but we're saved for them. We're not saved by our good works, but God saves us, empowers us by his spirit, adopts us, brings us into his family, counts us righteous before him, says you're justified, saves us for good works, that we would follow Jesus and live to the glory of God. Do you want to be equipped and complete, trained up for what God has saved you to do? You need go no farther than the written word of God. It is sufficient to make you complete, equipped for every good work. This is not the only part in scripture that talks about the sufficiency of God's word. In fact, throughout the entire Bible, you see constant, the prophets and apostles constantly repeating, go to the word and don't go beyond it for all matters of what you should believe and what you should do. In Deuteronomy 4.2, Moses says, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Do not add to it. Do not take away from it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Moses writes again, right before he dies, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are some things God does not reveal to us. The scriptures do not claim to reveal everything you want or I want to know. The scriptures claim to reveal everything I need to know. God doesn't give us everything. He gives us what we need to know. Therefore, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. God has revealed to you in Scripture everything you need to know to live a life that's pleasing to Him, to be saved through the work of Jesus. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Next time someone says to you, God told me this. Say, you better be quoting the scripture or I have to quote Proverbs 35 and 6 to you. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found to be a liar. You know what's okay to say? I think this is a wise thing to do. I think this is right. That's fine. Say that. As soon as you bring to me, God, I, I feel like God laid this on my heart. Yeah, maybe he did, but maybe he didn't. What we know for sure is what's written. Next time someone says to you, well, God told me this, and then they say it to you, say something like Dr. Keller has said to other people and say, really, God told me the exact opposite. What are we going to appeal to now? And you appeal to the scriptures. Do not add to his word lest you be rebuked and be found a liar. Isaiah, the Lord Jesus, and the Apostle Paul all warn against doctrine based on the precepts of men. Isaiah 29, Mark 7, Colossians 2. In Luke chapter 16, when Jesus tells the parable, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man in hell says, send back someone from the dead to tell my brothers that this is real, that, I need, that they need to repent and believe in Jesus. And in this parable, Abraham says to him, nope. If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they'll not listen to what God says in his written word, they will not believe even if someone rises from the dead. In Romans 16, the Apostle Paul says, Watch out for those who cause divisions or stumbling blocks concerning what you have been taught. Which is what the scripture says. Then he says, avoid them. If anyone in any way is putting stumbling blocks before what is written or causing you or trying to cause you to divide from what is written, Paul says, avoid them. In Galatians chapter 1, 
The Apostle Paul writes to the multiple churches in Galatia and says, Even if we, meaning the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. You get a revelation, you think you get some vision of an angel speaking to you? Paul says, nope, don't listen. Paul even says, if I come back to Galatia and tell you something contrary to what I've already told you, let me be accursed. He says it twice. As I've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The Lord Jesus' brother, according to the flesh, a son of Mary and Joseph, his name is Jude. He wrote a small book of the Bible, a small letter. And in verse 3, it just has one chapter. Verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. You know what once for all means? It means it's not going to be repeated. What Jude is saying is there are people coming and teaching you things that they're adding to the Bible. God said this to me. God gave me this revelation. And Jude says, no, the faith... Christian doctrine, the truth, has been once for all given to the saints. Contend for it. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, at the very end of our Bible, the Apostle John, writing what Jesus is revealing to him as an apostle, an authoritative representative of Jesus, says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The scriptures are sufficient for our salvation because they perfectly and sufficiently reveal who Jesus is and what we must do. We must turn from our sin and cling to him, trust in him, put our faith in him and his work alone. And scripture is sufficient to reveal that. The scriptures are also sufficient to make us more like Jesus so that we may grow. So what the scripture, what God calls in his word, sanctification being set apart. That's why Jesus prays in John chapter 17, the night before he's killed for our sin, Jesus prays and says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You want to be more like Jesus? Go to the word. God the Holy Spirit works through the word to make you more like Jesus. And the scriptures are also sufficient for worship. Perhaps one of the biggest issues of our day, the scriptures are sufficient to reveal to us what we should do to worship God. Whatever we do when we gather as Jesus' people to worship him, better be based on and founded upon what God says in his word. If you read the Bible honestly, just honestly, you will not arrive at any kind of conclusion that the Lord just cares that we're sincere, but doesn't really care what we do, just that we really are sincere about it. You're not going to get that. And you're also not going to get that the Lord doesn't really care in what ways we worship him, but just that we worship him and are sincere about it. You'll get the exact opposite if you read the Bible. In the Ten Commandments, the the first two commandments, 
have to deal with idolatry. Worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Worship. Second commandment has to do with God regulating the way in which he is to be worshipped. He doesn't say, worship me, and whatever you think that looks like, cool. He says, you do not make a graven image. No, 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 no. Worship me alone. But you don't do it in these ways. And then just a short time later, a passage that we preached a few years ago, one of our pastors in training, Kelton, preached this passage in the book of Exodus, chapter 32. Moses goes up on the mountain to commune with the Lord. And while he's up there, the people grow tired of waiting. And they say, you know what, Aaron, why don't you make this golden calf for us? Because we need something to see. We, we want to worship God that way. And if you pay attention in Exodus 32, they get this golden calf constructed, and they're worshiping this idol, this golden calf, but they're not calling it some other pagan god. They're looking at the golden calf saying, this is Yahweh who brought us out of Egypt. It was them saying, well, God told us to worship him, and we will worship him however we want to worship him. And God says, no, you don't worship me in whatever way you want to. I tell you how I am to be worshipped and what is pleasing to me. So Moses comes down from the mountain and sees them worshipping in a way that God had forbid them to worship, in a way that God had not prescribed them to worship. And he has the Ten Commandments, the tablets. And Moses goes and throws them down and breaks them. Then he comes down, gets that idol they had made to worship Yahweh, they said. He ground it up into dust, put it into the water, and made the people drink it. Ah, but God doesn't really care how we worship him. Just that we're sincere. You're not going to get that. I'm not going to get that from Exodus 32. After that, he made people run through the camp of his people with swords, putting people to death for worshiping him in a way that he had not prescribed. You fast forward a little bit and go to Leviticus chapter 10. And Aaron's sons... Nadab and Abihu, who are serving as priests in the tabernacle, they go before the altar and they offer fire, strange fire, Moses writes in Leviticus to tell us it was odd, it was strange. They seek to worship God and offer up this fire on the altar that was not the way God prescribed that he was to be worshipped. And what did God do to Nadab and Abihu? They offered up strange fire to worship him in a way that he had not prescribed. God killed them. Fire came out and God consumed them. Ah, but God doesn't really care how we worship him, just that we're sincere. You're not getting that from Leviticus 10. Fast forward later until King David has ascended his throne. And they're transporting the Ark of the Covenant that con contained the stone tablets that signified the very presence of God amidst his people. They were told in the law when they were transporting the Ark of the Covenant that they would put poles through the little holes that they had put in the Ark. God had told them how to build it and how to transport it. If you're moving it, you do it with poles. Because if you haven't been to Israel or seen pictures, rocky terrain, hills everywhere. You don't put it on a cart. You don't pull it by a horse. No, you put it on poles and it needs to be carried by multiple people on the poles so that if one person trips, there's another person right next to him. And the ark is not falling to the ground because the ark does not touch the ground. So David is bringing the ark back towards Jerusalem and they're pushing it or pulling it on a cart. Not doing it the way that God had prescribed them to do it. And of course what happens, you can guess, the ark starts to fall off the cart. 
And this signifies the holiness of God, the presence of God, our reverence for God. And so a guy named Uzzah reaches out to catch the ark. Because it's falling, it's going to fall into the dirt. And he touches the ark with his hand. What happens? God killed him immediately. But it doesn't really matter how we worship him, just that we're sincere. We can't ever think anything like that. What God prescribes in his word is enough, is sufficient to reveal to us how we are to be saved through Jesus, how we are to live for Jesus' glory, and how we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't need to go beyond the scriptures. And what the scriptures are ultimately going to reveal to you and me, friends, is not just that they are sufficient, they're going to reveal to you the sufficiency of the one that the Bible's all about. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the truly sufficient one. The scriptures reveal him. He's the sufficient one that says, everyone who comes to me, I will never cast them out. I will raise them up on the last day. Everyone who believes in me, Everyone who puts their confidence in me and what I've done in their place, they'll be adopted into the family of God and have their creator, God, as their father. Everyone who believed him, everyone who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And consequently, as Hebrews 7.25 says, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know what that means? Jesus lived without sin so you could be counted righteous. He died in place of sinners so that everyone who comes to faith in him will have their sins put as far as the east is from the west. And God will not count your sins against you anymore. And he didn't stay dead. You know, Jesus is alive. He ascended back to the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Because he's alive. And he always lives to be our representative before God, to make us acceptable before God. Do you know that you are insufficient and yet Jesus is totally sufficient to bring you all the way to glory? Do you know that you are insufficient to make yourself right with God, but Jesus is sufficient? Cling to him, trust him, look to his word alone. It's sufficient and he's sufficient. All who trust in him will never be put to shame. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your authoritative, inerrant, clear, necessary, and sufficient word. Help us to trust in Jesus alone and look to your word alone for what we need to know. Help us to worship you now in the ways that you've prescribed. We ask you to save and sanctify. Make us more like Jesus. We ask, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. I ask you to cause people to be born again through your living and abiding word. Pierce us. Convict us of our sin. Help us to see how sufficient Jesus is to save. And help us to trust in him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.